Warning, the following video contains explicit language which may be offensive to some viewers or inappropriate for children. The content within this video is intended for mature audiences only. Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of my own and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any other person or group of people. They do not purport to reflect the opinions or views of any group of people, person, or fanbase or its members. This video and the presentation of material therein do not imply the expression of any opinion other than mine. Hello, and welcome to this video. Um, hope everything out is going good f out there in the world for everybody. Um, I'm doing good. Um, I am slowly working on my over for the um, playlist for the my Jeanette stuff. I am s currently working on the my thoughts and ideas and expansion of the David Lynch 1984 Dune. Um, I hope to have that up here in the next week or so. We got the eclipse coming up on the 8th and I'm going to be out of town Sunday and Monday. So I will probably post this Saturday or Saturday night, my time. So Wherever you're at, you're in the world. I don't know where you're at, so it's going to be whatever the equivalent is. Um, so, um, the, uh, getting into the rabbits. Um, this is going to be part three of episode one of season two, The Wrong Way. Or oh, the wrong song, excuse me, I made a mistake there. Um, yes, and I I have unfortunately not um, taken care of the adware problem that I have on my computer right now. Um, been just too lazy to bother with it. Um, so, let's get underway and get into this. I hadn't pulled the string to change her eye color since my dad bought the doll for me on eBay two years earlier. I pulled the string and went through the cycle of her eye colors. Blue, pink, green, brown. Orange was missing. I felt a rush of something. A subtle shift in the world. Um... Building on the whole creepy doll thing, um, yeah, this, dolls can be creepy. Um, that's why I think women or girls have better fortitude than guys do because action figures, we'll call it action figures, um, they, uh, they're not creepy. They don't do the creepy things. If you look at Especially from probably about 1965 to present. Yeah, there have been some creepy ass dolls for um, people to play with. And that's just, or girls and young women and teenage girls. There's just been some creepy things come out over the years, so. Then a dark gray cloud or something seemed to fill the room. I tried to look at the gray cloud, but when I stared directly at it, it just seemed to fade away. When I kept it in my peripheral vision, however, I felt like I could see shapes moving, swimming, dark gray forms. Then I must have fallen asleep. Yeah, um... I honestly don't think that I'd be able to fall asleep, but you know, I have a, I have a fairly low tolerance for 
creepy supernatural things and it does get under my skin um which is weird because i will read stephen king books just one right after another doesn't face me but i think somewhere in my brain i understand that it's in a book and if it was to happen in like real life yeah um yeah i think that would actually creep me out the next day i did a deep dive into everything blithe absolutely no versions of the doll had been created with brown eyes this was an anomaly what was also anomalous was the fact that my doll definitely used to have orange eyes. I remember that very clearly. What the hell was happening? I can honestly say there have been times in my life that I have, I have just known something and known it, you know, to be a fact then come come to find out I'm wrong but it's I don't know how things get entrenched in our brains like that in the, our reality I should say but within the rabbits universe I don't know the because they play on the whole shifting parallel universe Mandela effect and all that crazy stuff um it does it, it it does provide some kind of craziness to it um i looked at every website i could find related to blythe but there was nothing that helped explain what had happened on the back of the doll's torso was a bunch of text kinner's trademark made in hong kong and the patent numbers this was where I eventually found something. While looking at dozens of photographs of people's Blythe dolls from 1972, I noticed a discrepancy. On the backs of all the 1972 Blythe dolls I could find, there were no patent numbers, only the words patents pending. So, I started looking into the two patent numbers listed on the back of my Blythe doll. Nothing. I left a comment detailing my experiences playing the game called At Night on that Korean website, and didn't think about any of this stuff again for a few weeks. Um, somebody who has done research on things that I've owned, patent numbers, uh, serial numbers, stuff like that. Um, when you come across an anomaly, I have a firearm that's an anomaly um, in, in sorts um, because the firearm I got, I bought used at a gun store. And when I ran the serial number, it turned out it was one of about 300 maybe 400 pistols that were made for the employees of the firearms manufacturer and at some point this gun got sold or traded or whatever so if you look through the particular company Ruger firearms just to kind of be transparent um, you will you won't find this particular far or actually at the time that I purchased it they may have have come in mass production with it now but it just when you start when you start searching for stuff like that anomalies get kind of weird and and you get go down these rabbit holes pun intended so that's kind of cool. Then one day after I described what happened to me while playing the game to a friend of mine, she asked to see the Korean website. I pulled it up. The website looked exactly the same. 
The same games, the same graphics, but I did notice something new. Somebody had posted a comment replying to the comment I'd left describing my experience playing the game called At Night. Right there, beneath the comment I'd left under my favorite username at the time, BiscuitHammer85, was a reply. It was written in English. One word. Rabbits. Now, for those of you that have listened to this particular playlist since episode one, season one, part one, this is kind of, you know, kind of par for the, the whole show th or the whole rabbits universe. Um, and these poor unsuspecting people getting caught up in this universe, it's just, it gets weird sometimes. I tried to get in touch with the poster, left numerous replies, but I never heard back. My Blythe mystery was a dead end. I didn't think about rabbits for years after that. High school and college came and went, and although I continued to play video and role-playing games, I didn't spend time digging into any more alternate reality games or explore any real-world gaming experiences similar to the elevator game. <clears throat> now... <clears throat> When I was a kid, and when we would go on like vacation or in school, like on field trips and stuff, and we were someplace that had an elevator, we played a variant of that game in which you get in the elevator and you push every floor and you systematically you find something that's you when you when the elevator door is open you see something weird you go out then when the elevator returns you go back in and you pick a random floor um, but this elevator game that she plays seems like to be a whole lot more fun <laughs> I remained focused on getting my degree in journalism and then struggling through a career in indie rock, where I founded a record label, managed a couple of bands, and eventually ended up writing for a very popular music website with a reputation for harsh criticism. It was about two years ago, while I was working at that pop culture vertical, that rabbits entered my life again. But this time, there would be no forgetting it. Yeah, um, that's something I need to take, I like about season two. We are probably about a little over half to three quarters of the way into this episode. And we're just now, we, we get all this, you know, we get, you know, 10, 12 minutes of character development. Which I, which I really enjoy because a lot of the stuff that is building up in her character comes to play in later episodes. It's kind of interesting. I was reintroduced to rabbits by somebody I'd met my first year out of high school while I was working on a profile for a terrible EDM artist. I'm using the word artist extremely liberally in this case. Okay, could you please state your name for our listeners? Astro Nadav. And could you describe how we met? How many listeners are we talking about here? Well, that depends. On what? On how compelling you are. Oh, once again, it's up to me to carry Riley Bennett. <laughs> Fine. You want compelling? You got it. It's our first episode. We won't really know how many listeners we have until a few episodes have aired. After they catch the dulcet tone of my voice, they're going to have to stick around. They're not going to be able to help themselves. That's science. Oh, yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> okay, so what was the question again? How did the two of us meet? Right. So we were working on a profile that... Can I say 
on the show? Mm, you can't say anywhere. Fine. So we were working on a DJ profile together. I was shooting pictures. You were doing whatever it is that you do. Writing. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Now, do you remember the first time you heard the term rabbits related to the game? I do. Right. So we decided to go for a drink one day. This was a year or so ago. St. Patrick's Day. Exactly. You were working on an article about... Okay. When I was in my 20s, which was about 30 years ago, um, the... St. Patty's Day was, yeah, it was, I would take, I would take, I would take off St. Patrick's Day and the day, and the next two days afterward, because it would take me that long to deal with the hangover. So it's just kind of cool how they throw little bits of stuff like that, that you can relate to. But an A-list actor who had just released an album, you kept listening to it over and over like you just couldn't believe it happened. Oh my God, I blocked that out. <laughs> and after listening to that guy's, can you call that music? No. <laughs> okay, well, after listening to that guy's stuff for a few hours, we needed a palate cleanser. I suggested we visit my local watering hole. I believe you pitched it as a shitty jukebox and even shittier tequila. Amen. And it was while we were listening to a song on that juke. Well, um, yeah, tequila is... Tequila is not something I drink anymore just simply because tequila makes me stupid. I mean, like violent stupid. So I stick to, you know, mead, wine, beer and stuff like that because it makes me happy stupid. Yeah, um, tequila, mm, not my friend box something called smoke gets in your eyes a number one hit recorded by the platters and released in 1958 that something happened yeah jenny fucking happened jenny slater oh yes she was your roommate at the time off and on shortly after the song started playing jenny slater jumped up from a booth in the back of the bar and ran towards the jukebox she jumped over two tables. Could you describe what happened next? She starts smashing her hands against the jukebox. It's like she's trying to break through and stop the music or something. And she was screaming at the top of her lungs. What was she screaming? It's not supposed to be the platters. This song isn't right. None of this should be happening. It's rabbits, it's rabbits, it's rabbits over and over. And then what happened? While she was being held down by the bartender and two of the servers, the next song started to play. And what was the next song called? It was a song by Jeff Buckley called The Door Is Open. Yeah, um, that you should understand from season one about the importance of the term The Door Is Open. So if you haven't listen to season one or haven't actually sat down and went to the rabbits podcast website which i highly 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 recommend doing the the um this is a very important thing uh, to keep in the back of the little brain let it pop around between the wrinkles Now, Aster and I were both huge Jeff Buckley fans. In fact, it was one of the things that bonded us together. We'd both dated the guitar player in a semi-famous local band whose biggest claim to fame was that he was Jeff Buckley's cousin. Because the two of us were such big Jeff Buckley fans, we recognized Jeff's voice immediately. Also, because we were such big fans, we knew for a fact that Jeff Buckley had never released or recorded any song titled The Door Is Open. After the incident, Aster and I went to visit Jenny in the hospital. We went up to her room, 
that she wasn't there. Yeah, um, that's always unnerving because I've have, have had that happen in real life. Um, I had a friend of mine get hospitalized, was in a car crash and was in the hospital and was in there for, a, you know, a fairly good amount of time and was released. But in the time it took for him to get released, and this is in the 90s before cell phones were common, for him to get released and go home to let everyone know he's been released, me and some other people who worked with him, who were friends with him, went to the hospital and, you know, we went in, we waved to the people at the desk and we went up to his room and it was empty. That's always always unnerving until you talk to somebody and get the get the 411 on that it's just it's kind of kind of unnerving sometimes nobody had any idea what happened to her she was just gone vanished there was an investigation and Aster and I both spoke with the police I didn't have much to tell them. I knew Jenny a little, but only through Aster. She'd lived with him off and on for a couple of years. Apparently, they hooked up once a long time ago. Even though it didn't take, they remained close. Aster told the police that Jenny had been acting very strange before she disappeared, that she'd become obsessed with playing a game. He didn't know what the game was called or how it was played, only that at least part of the game involved following clues in the real world. He didn't only tell all of this stuff to the police, he told it to me as well. Jenny's disappearing from that hospital was the wildest thing that had ever happened to either of us. It was all we could talk about for a long time. As I said previously, when something like that happened, I mean, ours had logical, explainable things that caused the, my mic is in the way, caused us, you know, that momentary thing of that shock. Then we found out and everything was cool, but I could imagine Maybe I can, I don't know. The, the, the whole thing, something you know, somebody you know through somebody else and you and that somebody else go to visit them and they're gone and nobody has a clue, not even the hospital staff. Yeah, that's just, yeah, that gets weird quick. The chatter about Jenny's disappearance eventually died down. The jukebox in Aster's local watering hole had been replaced by a satellite radio the day after the incident, so we had no way of knowing if that impossible Jeff Buckley song was still in there. We checked everywhere online, and that song didn't appear to exist outside of that jukebox. Convinced that we must have experienced some kind of weird mutual hallucination, Glitch in the Matrix, maybe. Mm -hmm. Those Matrix fans, Keanu Reeves fans, you know, think about it. Astra and I put everything aside and went on with our lives. We didn't think about Jenny Slater for a long time until Astor found her hidden stuff. While Astor was getting his spare bedroom ready for his new tenant, he found something hidden under a floorboard in the closet. A handful of loose documents and a journal of some kind. The loose documents were research material on a man named Kellen Meacham. Jenny had only filled the first quarter or so of the journal, but what was there was pretty insane. There were wild scribbles, partial paragraphs, symbols, and maps. The journal appeared to be Jenny Slater's notes about the game she'd been playing. Now, if conspiracy theories are playing with conspiracy, conspiracy, ah, I gotta learn how to talk. Conspiracy theories are your thing. Um, 
it's Meacham is someone interesting to read because it's kind of out there. The journal opens with the following paragraph. I'm going to start keeping notes here. I've been noticing changes more and more frequently. I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure any of this is actually rabbits. I'm honestly not sure that any of this is actually real. There are a few pages of hastily scribbled maps, seemingly random numbers and symbols, a few more pages contemplating something called the Meacham Radiance, and finally, the last few entries appear to be tracking Ginny's progress as she follows a series of clues. Now, if you really want to have fun, just kill some time. Google Meacham Radiant and just go down that rabbit hole. Just boom, just dive head first because it's fun. Um, especially if you understand that maybe not everyone is tethered to our reality the way we are and it gets really kind of cool and it like i said just google meach meacham radiant and just go from there just take every possible lead and just it's it's just an adventure it's kind of cool I called Aster and asked if he'd be willing to sit down with me and go over the last few entries of that journal. But Aster was out. He didn't want any part of this investigation into what happened to Jenny. He told me that he'd looked into the game unofficially known as Rabbits and found out that it was dangerous, that people died while playing it. He told me that, and I'm quoting him here, the game you're looking into is haunted as fuck. And isn't everything in life, though, if you think about it? You know, you make wrong choice driving down the freeway and boom, you're dead. I mean, it's just one of those things how we, we will see something we don't understand and automatically fear it. Then you have something that we take for granted, driving, flying in airplanes, riding on buses, walking the store, you know, they're just as dangerous, but because they're commonplace, we don't, we, we don't extrapolate, we don't extrapolate. I don't think that's the word. I think I'm mispronouncing the word, but um, we don't, really worry about it it's like the 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 concept of you are more likely to get murdered in cold blood by somebody you know and or trust and is a family member wife's you know spouse child relative those are the ones more likely that are going to murder you than some stranger on the street. But we ignore all that because if we don't ignore it, it will drive us fucking crazy. So it's just, you know, it's just all of this stuff, how our brains process things, how our brains will see something we don't understand and go, that's evil, that can, you know, that's bad. Whereas there are other things that are quantifiably dangerous that we just ignore. Thankfully, Aster let me take photographs of Jenny's journal and those documents on Kellen Meacham before he sent them to Jenny's parents. I went through the journal and those pages on Kellen Meacham looking for anything that might shed light on what had happened to Jenny and why. One of the pages in Jenny's journal was dedicated to a group of people Jenny'd met who had apparently dedicated their lives to uncovering something that Kellen Meacham called radiance. These people believe that Kellen Meacham had discovered secret pathways of energy beneath the world. I found all of this stuff extremely interesting, but I didn't find any clue to what had happened to Jenny. Nothing I could use to continue my investigation. 
As interesting as Jenny's journal was, I'd come to a dead end. That is, until two weeks ago. Um, yeah, um, like I said, it's just in dead ends. I'm real good, or I think I'm real good, I should say. When I come up, when I'm doing research, or if I'm looking into something, or I'm trying to plan something, and I hit a dead end or a brick wall or something like that, I step away from it and intentionally do something that is so different than I then when I return back to it passing through that brick wall or passing or or extending the road beyond the dead end is easier so you know sometimes things help time helps I was sitting at my desk going over Jenny's journal for the hundredth time when I noticed something. There was a moving truck outside my building. The name stenciled onto the side of the truck was Traveler Moving. I wouldn't have thought much about it, except for the fact that I just looked up from a stack of junk mail on my desk. The letter sitting atop the pile was from Traveler's Insurance. Yeah, um, living out in the country, um, these last seven years or so, stuff like that, um, yeah, something like that would get into, would get into the whole, the whole neighborhood would get into it, um, I mean, our neighborhood is three mobile homes and four houses, you know, comprising a area of probably about, 10, nah, more about 25, 30 acres of land. So yeah, we're, we're, you know, stuff like that doesn't happen. But when I lived in town in the apartment complex, there was a couple of times, especially after Hurricane Katrina, where you'd see a van or repair, you know, a van, a moving van or a repair van or something. You'll see it that one time and never see it again so yeah that's another reason why i enjoy living out in the country you don't have to deal with weird shit like that i'm not superstitious at all and i'm not a believer in everything happens for a reason or any of that spiritual new agey stuff but i was struck by two things in that moment the first thing was that name traveler it was what people who played the elevator game were supposed to be called. The second thing that struck me in that moment was that the coincidence was even more significant. Not only had I just looked up from a letter from Traveler's Insurance and discovered the Traveler's moving truck, I'd also just purchased a game on eBay. An old role-playing game from the 70s called, you guessed it, Traveler. That was, if... If I remember correctly, it's the same RPG tabletop that we used to play when I was junior high, high school. We had a local hobby shop um, at Carpus Cove called Paradise Hobbies. And somewhere around here in one of the, one of the bookcases behind me, or maybe in one of the bookcases that are off camera, um, I have the rules for it which is weird, but, um, but yeah, that, that, that was a cool game. <laughs> now, could all of this be a coincidence? Absolutely. In fact, although I did run out and take a bunch of pictures of that moving truck, I was pretty sure that as surprising as it was, this was still nothing but a set of remarkable coincidences. I believe in coincidence. I don't trust coincidence. I don't know where that's from or where I originally heard it. Um, probably in a movie or read it in a book or something somewhere, but that is something that uh, I tend to... It's gotten me out of trouble. It's kept me from getting in trouble several times. That was until my friend Charlie asked me to meet her for a drink.
Hey, what's with the voice recorder? I'm uh, working on an audio project. Cool, what is it? It's a podcast. Of course it is. <laughs> what's that supposed to mean? Everybody has a podcast these days, even my massage therapist. I find that hilarious because I'm not really sure if the videos I do would be considered a podcast. I don't consider them a podcast just because of the format. Um, though I do want to do on my Gen X thing, a thing with my sister-in-law, just because my sister-in-law is fun to mess with. Um, just... Uh, that would to me that would be more of a podcast where you have interaction where I'm just up here prattling on and on with you know no you know counterpoint or anything so I'm not sure how that really works um I don't know I'm not real sure I've, I've googled what is a podcast but the 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 definitions as I read them as I interpret them are fairly nebulous Kind of like blogging in the 1990s. What's your podcast about? Well, I'm not sure yet. I just started. Intriguing. Yeah, or a complete waste of time. Well, if it turns into something, let me know. My friend Nick is the boss over at the Public Radio Alliance. He's always looking for new stuff. Thanks. I'll definitely let you know. Do you remember this place? I remember a lot of fuzzy mornings after trivia night. You want to play pinball? Oh, yeah. I love pinball. Um, I would rather play pinball than video games. That's just, I'm old. That happens when you get, when you grow up with pinball, then video games come in as kind of a second thing. I just noticed the hair on the back looks like it's part of my goatee. That's kind of weird. Yeah, that, that was bothering me. That was this hair. Yeah, this hair here, the way it was laying, looked like I had just, just really weird growth. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and just move this hair out of the way because it was weirding me out uh, looking at my playback. Uh, so Charlie and I played pinball almost every night back then. We stuck around and played until the bar closed. It was really nice to just hang out with Charlie again. I'd been feeling a bit stressed, and it turned out that pinball and drinks were the perfect recipe for relaxation. Now, back in my younger days, um, pinball and pop was really interesting. Um, yeah, in my teens and early 20s, Though now in Texas that the Delta 8 hemp variant of THC is legal currently before our Attorney General goes around and screws that up. Um, that might be interesting. That, that might be gummies and pinball. That might be interesting. Um, but that is neither here nor there. And depending on where you are, where you live, check into your local laws and make sure whatever you're doing is legal. I do not condone breaking the law. I do not condone um, doing things that are risky. Therefore, consider what I just said about pinballs and pot, pinball and pot as an anecdotal thing. But I can't control what you do. The next afternoon, I was scrolling through a bunch of photos we'd taken the night before. The first photo was a picture of Charlie standing in front of the pinball machine, pointing to her high score. She was giving me the finger with her other hand. I smiled and scrolled through the rest of the pictures. As I went back to look at a few of them again, I swiped past the pinball picture to the last photo I'd taken of the traveler moving truck. I noticed it immediately. The license plate number of the truck. It was the exact same number as the high score Charlie had gotten on one of the pinball machines. Something called Bride of Pinbot. Once again, I believe in coincidences, but I don't trust coincidences. 
another coincidence. I put on my coat and walked back over to the pub. There was nobody in there except for the bartender. I ordered a Coke and made my way over to the pinball machines. Standing against the wall, along with three pinball machines, were a number of old stand-up arcade games. Double Dragon, Missile Command, Star Castle, Berserk, and Galaga. I played the pinball machine called The Bride of Pinbot for hours, but nothing happened. I was about to head home, but I had one quarter left. I'd played a bit of Berserk at my old university pub. It was one of the only arcade games on campus, so I played it quite a bit. I slipped my last quarter into the machine and started playing. I did pretty well, considering I hadn't played in forever. When I finally lost, I somehow managed to rack up enough points to make the list of high scores. The screen read, Congratulations, Player One. You have joined the Immortals in the Berserk Hall of Fame. Enter your initials. So I entered my initials, but what happened next wasn't standard. Instead of redisplaying the high scores, which should now include mine, something else popped up. It flashed across the screen for just a moment. It was a four-word message. The door is open. The phrase again. Which I said, that's just something you need to keep in your mind. A couple of seconds later, I was looking at another list. There were nine Roman numerals followed by names listed on the screen. It was what Rabbit's players refer to as the circle, the list of the winners of each of the nine iterations of the game. During season one of the Rabbit's podcast, Carly Parker claimed she'd discovered the circle on an old Defender 2 machine in a convenience store located in a building that used to house the Magician's Arcade. We now know that the Magician's Arcade never actually disappeared, that it's still located in the same place. And we now know something else. If the version of the circle that I'd uncovered on the Berserk machine in that pub was current and legit, there was no winner listed for the eighth or ninth iterations of the game. If that version of the circle was correct, the ninth version of the game wasn't over. Ba -ba -ba -bum. It's rabbits. I'm Riley Bennett. We'll be back again next week. Until then, stay safe. Yeah, this um, is in an really interesting place right now in this uh, uh, first episode, or the ending of the first episode. Um, next week, we will be starting Season 2, Episode 2, Part 1, uh, titled Play the Game, Find the Game. This is going to be a fun one. Um, the This is a long one because the first two I did were relatively short <laughs> and with the eclipse coming up on April 8th the I wanted to get, you know, stuff ready so this is, you know, this is going to be a fairly long video. I mean, if you're if you're listening to this part now, you know it's a fairly long video. Plus, if you ran your cursor over the little thing that YouTube shows your little thumbnail, you'd see that this is a fairly long video. So, I appreciate everybody for sticking a sticking around, uh, enduring this long, excruciating video. So. Until next time, peace. Hey, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are?